Norman, we passed an important milestone in the COVID pandemic this week. We did. We sure did because after... I missed it. I missed it. no, I'm about to tell you what it is because you have already experienced this milestone for yourself, but I never have before. This week I received fan mail in the form of socks. Oh, I'm jealous. <laughs> you know, no, you don't get our to be secret jealous. Sock, our secret sock giver has got to you. Yeah, because you got quokka socks and then yeah. you got medical devices socks and I made I some did. joke about liking fine wines and look, it's wine You've and got cheese it. socks. <laughs> Can't wait. Do they fit? I haven't tried them on yet. They're still brand new in the packet. Yeah, well, in their the... virgin state, but uh, not for long. Thank you to our secret sock giver yet again, mysterious Corona Caster. Mysterious, but very well loved. Anyway, let's get into Corona Cast, the show all about the coronavirus and sometimes other nasties as well. I am health reporter Tegan Taylor coming to you from Jagera and Turbal Land. And I'm physician and journalist Dr. Norman Swan coming to you from Gadigal Land. And I did promise other nasties as well. And I want to kick us off today, Norman, with a bit of news from not just the COVID land, but infectious diseases, because there's been um, notifications of measles in Queensland. Yes. And this happens on a reasonably regular basis now. Our borders are open. Somebody arrives in Australia from a country where measles um, vaccination is not as prevalent as it should be, and they catch measles and bring it back unknowingly. So this is somebody who landed in Australia. I think they landed in Victoria, didn't they? Yeah, to start with, but then very quickly came up to Queensland. And the contact tracers have found out where exactly this person has gone. So you can go into the website if you live in southeast Queensland to find out where this person has gone in case there's a contact. And this is the worry that somebody brings this in. It's not intentional. Um, They may or may not be fully immunised themselves. It's not known in this case. Um, And potentially spread it. So my question with this is, we have really good vaccination levels against measles. Childhood vaccination levels are really high, 95 plus percent in Australia. Why is it a problem if one person with measles is around? Because there are always some people who are not fully vaccinated. There are some subpopulations who are not well immunised at all. And there are parts of the population where they grew up in Australia either with no measles vaccination or where they only had one measles jab and they haven't had two because the national immunisation schedule now gives you two measles, mumps, rubella immunisations. Um, And if you haven't had a second, you could be under immunised. So they reckon that there are quite a few thousand people in Australia under immunised for measles and therefore at risk. Babies don't get immunised in the first few months of life, which means that they're vulnerable too. And it's a very nasty disease in childhood. So, yeah, definitely a lot of people still vulnerable, so we do need to have our wits about us. Yeah, and if you think that you've only ever had one measles immunisation, talk to your doctor about whether you're eligible for a top-up. And another piece of this time it is COVID-related news, there's been a study about a proof-of-concept device that plays to one of my personal uh, favourite topics when it comes to COVID, which is, of course, air quality. And it is actually able to detect coronavirus particles in the air to an extent that we haven't really seen before. These are prototypes and the research has been published in a leading journal, Nature Communications, which, and they say that it works as well, if not better than PCR testing. And this could revolutionise all sorts of respiratory viruses in the environment, because as we know, they're aerosol spread and check whether or not an environment is safe. So this is a major innovation, um, whether or not that can be produced at scale, because these are prototypes produced in the lab, and at, and at scale that uh, that's affordable, and that you could validate it in large rooms, large organisations like hospitals and so on to ensure the air is safe. Um, how you'd actually use them is unclear at the moment to, to maximum benefit, but it is a major advance. It's a pretty interesting engineering paper to read. I'm not sort of reading engineering papers very often, but they've developed a thing called a wet cyclone, which just sounds kind of gross, to be honest. And one of the ways that they've actually uh, detect the virus is using nanobodies derived from llamas. I always knew llamas had some use in life, but now we know. (laughs) And so on to some questions from our audience, uh, a stalwart of Coronacast in the past. Cathy's written in asking about Paxlovid and about the fact that people can rebound with symptoms after their course of Paxlovid has um, sort of ended. But one of the questions she asks in her message really kind of got to me and I want to know the answer. How does Paxlovid actually work? Well, let's talk about rebound to begin with. 
rebound is really fascinating. Some research has suggested that rebound is no more common with the antivirals than with COVID itself. In other words, you get better from COVID and it comes back. And we talked about that at the beginning of the of the pandemic. Um, but it is clearly a phenomenon that the, you do get rebound after you've been on the antiviral, particularly Paxlovid. It happens with Molnupiravir as well. Now, the extent to which it happens is not entirely clear. It could be anywhere between 1% and 3 or 4%, depending on which study you believe. But it's not as common as you might believe. But a lot of people are getting antivirals, so even a 1% or 2% incidence could add up to a lot of people. How Paxlovid works is that it latches on to a part of the virus structure which allows the virus to replicate. So the virus needs to have this piece of machinery, this genetic machinery going for it to be able to replicate and divide and spread. And this, the, the antibody in Paxlovid attaches to this part of the virus and um, and immobilizes it so that it cannot replicate. There is a second drug called ritonavir in the in the mix of Paxlovid as well, and that's to slow down the the metabolism of the active compound. Um, so that it lasts longer in the body. We do use uh, Paxlovid, which is the drug name, which we don't usually do on coronacast, but that's because the actual uh, generic name is a bit of a mouthful. Nermetravir. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to get it right, am I? Nermetravir. <laughs> Nematrilvir and ritonavir. Oh, you can just mumble it. Right, you, right, you, right. You, you, really, you really know what you're talking about here. It's the, uh, it's the audio equivalent of a doctor's messy handwriting. Yeah, and, the, and just coming back to the original thing, though, now that you can pronounce it, is that people have wondered well, whether or not you should actually extend the, uh, the duration of the drug or come back for another dose of the drug. And most, if not all, people who get a rebound get a very mild disease and they reckon it's not, in fact, worth it. But when you do get rebound, you can be infectious for up to 16 or 17 days. And there's actually been some recent research into Paxlovid looking at how protective it is at uh, post-COVID sequelae. Yes, this is a huge study from Taiwan, and it's not a randomised trial. So you've got to take that into account um, because... Um, it's an observational study and all sorts of other things could intervene to suggest the res- to, to, to conclude the results are maybe not as valid as they should be. But on the basis of it, it's many thousands of people followed through from March 2020 through to July 2022. And they've matched two groups of people. One group of people had COVID-19 and got Paxlovid and one group of people did not get Paxlovid. Now, the virus changed during that time, so that's one of the confounders here. A different variant emerged? That's right. So it goes through the original version, through Alpha, Delta and so on, and through to Omicron, where most people who would have got got it got during Omicron. Um, and anyway, the, the results suggest that, and they are looking at neuropsychiatric symptoms, so they're th- looking at things like dementia, anxiety, depression, thinking problems, and so on. Insomnia is another one. And what they found was that on average, there was about a 30 to 40% reduction in the risk of these neuropsychiatric symptoms, this is what they're calling them, in, between, in, a, 90 to a, in a 90 day to one year period of follow-up. And for some of these for some of these symptoms, the reduction was as high as 70%, particularly with dementia, thinking problems. So it does, you know, again, if you, it's an observational study, you've got to take that into account, but it does look as though antivirals will reduce the risk of these neurological long COVID symptoms, not prevent them completely, but at least partially. I've got more audience questions for you, Norman. I've got a question from Shane who's asking about a positive rapid antigen test and when it's safe to return to the office after getting a positive rat because he's saying if you kind of keep on testing after you've, um, you've had sort of 10 days or so at home, is it actually, are you actually still infectious? Should we be ignoring rats after day 10? Should we be waiting for the rat to come back negative before going back to the office? The official advice is that um, isolation is not mandatory, but you should stay at home for seven days. Um, this is voluntary, but you should stay at home for seven days. And you should certainly avoid spaces and people which are high risk, such as hospitals, aged care homes, and so on, and people who might be frail, elderly, or have comorbidities. And you should 
should be wearing an N95 mask. They don't say N95 mask in the advice. They say mask, but really, if you want to avoid spreading, you really should be wearing an N95 mask if you are positive. Now, the arguments over whether or not you should wait until the rat is negative, that's not in the official advice. But when your rat turns negative, you're very unlikely to be infectious. That's the best evidence I can give you. And one more question. This one is from Steve, who's asking about long COVID. And the question is sort of in two parts. One is, if Steve is up to date with his vaccinations, but takes no other precautions, what are his chances of getting long COVID? But then also, if he's had COVID before and had a bout of long COVID and then has recovered, what are the chances of getting long COVID again with a subsequent infection? So the answer to the first question it varies according to which study you look at. It's probably around 3 to 5% is your chance of long COVID if you're infected and fully immunised. In terms of having had long COVID before, you do seem to be at increased risk next time, but it's, it almost resets where you uh, your, your risk does not go down next time. It's either the same or it's higher, but the the evidence about exactly how much higher is not entirely clear. It certainly doesn't go down next time around. Is that because there's a recent study that shows that some people have a gene that seems to predispose them to at least severe COVID in the first instance, so maybe long COVID as well? Severity does increase your risk of long COVID, but these days most people who are getting long COVID have not had severe disease, or at least not severe enough that they've ended up in hospital. So the gene study you're referring to is a massive genetic study looking for genes that might be associated with long COVID. And what they found was a gene they suspected anyway of predicting severe COVID. So they found, they confirmed there is a gene, um, uh, starts with the you know, fox, we've got all sorts of names for these genes, <laughs> but essentially this fox type gene is um, prevalent in people who are more at risk of ending up in hospital with severe COVID and then secondarily then developing long COVID. So it's not really a gene for long COVID, it's a gene for severe COVID which increases your risk of long COVID. I think they've yet to pin down specific genes that, give, that put you at risk for uh, COVID itself. Long, long COVID itself. And we should mention that's still a preprint study, hasn't been peer-reviewed yet. That's right, which is why I'm mumbling and stumbling. <laughs> More mumbling, less speaking clearly. I, I only mumble in preprints. <laughs> and when pronouncing generic names for antivirals. That's your problem, not mine. <laughs> All right, we better leave it there. We'll catch you next Wednesday. See you then. Subscribe to listen to more free podcasts or download the ABC Listen app and stream ad-free.